So welcome. This is the Rebus Community and Open Textbook Network Office Hours. We collaborate on these monthly conversations together to bring all of you together. You're a community of open textbook collaborators and practitioners. And in these sessions, we talk informally about issues in open textbook publishing. So um, I cannot say enough that these conversations are community driven and they're one way that we can think and work together on support and solutions. So please let us know what topics you want to explore in future sessions. If we don't cover everything today, if you want to revisit this, um, we are here to have the conversations that, that you need to have um, and explore, excuse me, the issues you're working on. So um, I'm Karen Lauritsen. I'm Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network. And today we're here to talk about OER policies. We're gonna hear from three people representing a variety of institutions where OER policies have been implemented. We're gonna hear how and why they were developed, what's included in their policies, the stakeholders involved, and any stories from their development. So um, this is an informal format. Uh, it's focused on conversation. Our guests will talk for maybe up to five minutes and then we'll turn things over to you for your questions and comments and i'm quite sure that many of you also have stories to share about your policies and you're absolutely invited to do that um, we're all here to learn from one another so we have three guests with us today um, i'll let you know who those three guests are and then turn it over to them so uh, rebecca vandevoord is assistant vice president academic outreach and innovation liaison to the provost office and director of learning innovations at Washington State University. We also have Jessica Norman. She's e-learning librarian at Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. And finally, Billy Meinke, OER technologist at University of Hawaii at Manoa. So Rebecca, without further ado, I will turn things over to you. And we will unmute you. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I just realized I don't have the policy open. So I was just trying to quickly get to that. But um, I'll give a little bit of history. I am with our WSU distance global campus, but also do work as a liaison to the provost office. And um, a few years ago, the then interim president for WSU put together a affordability task force. Basically, students were complaining about the cost of textbooks, and he wanted a group of individuals to look into what kinds of things WSU could do to decrease the cost to students. Um, one of those being OER is what the task force um, came up with, although there are several other initiatives moving forward as well. But on the OER side, it really gave us an opening to finally, those of us who'd been interested in hoping to move in this direction, gave us more kind of an administrative top-down um, window to begin the conversation. Uh, at the same time, there were some seed grants available through the provost office. And so my unit AOI and the WSU libraries went together to apply for a seed grant to provide funding to faculty to create OER. And so that's, that's kind of where we were getting started with OERs on the WSU campus in an official way. There certainly have been individuals who've created OER over the years, moved away from textbooks, used alternatives, but sort of officially this began in, I think that was 2015. So I'm not a person who had a lot of history in the OER area, but was fortunate enough to work with Mike Caulfield, who is um, definitely has been involved with OER a lot of years, was at uh, MIT with an open course um, initiative. So Mike and I talked, and one of his recommendations was that WSU have a policy about OER. And to be honest, I wasn't exactly clear why that was necessary, but um, did move that forward um, using the OER policy development tool, which I found to be really helpful that uh, David Wiley and others have put together. 
So I started from that and sent a first draft to the provost's office in September of 2016. It took about 18 months to finally walk that policy through all of the steps that uh, people felt were necessary and received. Um, I just found it a, lo a lot more challenging, a lot more difficult than I thought it would received a lot of pushback from faculty because their perception was this was the administration saying everyone has to create OER, even though I continually said um, the, the policy clearly states this is a policy that is in place for faculty who are being funded by WSU through grant funds to create OER and and that's something they have to apply for. So, you know, from my perspective, in no way was it a mandate that everybody's going to create an OER, but, but faculty read it that way. So it went first to the provost's office, um, then was vetted through the attorney general. And then the provost's office felt it should go through faculty senate. And so it went to the faculty affairs committee. And that's where the faculty you know, really they had a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. So one was about whether or not this was a mandate. Secondly, they were concerned about um, duration of their responsibility for material they create. So if they create something for a course, they make it open, three years later, they're no longer teaching that course. Are they still responsible to continue to update, maintain those materials? We had a lot of conversation around that. A lot of conversation around ADA accessibility. Whose responsibility is that and who covers the cost? And we have not resolved all of that yet. The policy does state that faculty are responsible to ensure ADA accessibility and copyright clearance of any materials they use, um, which they are uncomfortable with. But ultimately, any faculty member can create an OER and ultimately they can they're the ones putting content in it, so they have to take some ownership of being responsible for those areas. Um, they wanted to understand the ultimate goal of the policy statement, um, which really was, well, is to protect the university in situations where the university is funding these projects. And then secondly, in hindsight, this did initiate a lot of good conversation around OERs with a number of groups from administrators, faculty, um, people who weren't really aware of what OER were, is, and then they're having to review this policy and asking questions about it. So although it was a long and painful process from my perspective, uh, I think ultimately it was very beneficial and really helped to sort of clarify what does OER mean at WSU? What is it we're trying to accomplish? Um, it's not the only affordability initiative, as I mentioned. Um, so is that a good start? Do you want to know? What else do you want to know? That's great, Rebecca. That's a really okay. helpful snapshot. And I'm sure we'll talk more about um, what, what um, I, I was... <laughs> I heard you say it was a long and painful process, um, but that there was a good outcome um, in, in inspiring conversation around OER. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that um, with the group as well. So thank you very much. Um, Jessica, I will now turn it over to you um, and I'll let, I'll let you know if we can hear you. If you wanna start talking, I'll just um, confirm. Jessica, we cannot hear you yet. Okay. There you go. Now I'm probably, yeah, there I yeah. am. Okay, hi, thanks. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jessica. I'm from Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, which is located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. If you're not familiar with our system up there, I'm at a two-year polytechnic. So um, we are applied educational um, institution, which kind of, puts a, a certain flavor on our activities. Um, but to kind of just step you through the, the beginnings of our process to implement an institutional uh, policy, really it started back in 2017, 2016-17. Uh, we had a new VP academic who um, decided that he wanted to build our first ever education plan 
with a consultative process. So he had faculty, staff, and students work through a process. And myself and some other folks who were interested planted the seeds for OER in that plan or in that conversation. When the plan was released, it was uh, an increased emphasis on student-first activities and support. And there was a clear statement that said, um, as part of effective teaching practices, that the institution would support faculty in adapting, adopting, and creating OERs. And that immediately generated the phone call from academic council or academic chairs and faculty who said, what is this? What is an OER? What, is, what does this mean in terms of using them? What's the practical implications? Um, so after that was launched, uh, a committee was formed. I was a co-chair for that, along with a curriculum specialist on campus. We also had faculty and uh, our copyright officer involved in that process. It was a nine-month process to create the, com the, um, the policy and have it go through the approval and review. Um, the stakeholders that were consulted during that time were our students. We did uh, student surveys and talked with the student government. We did multiple faculty focus groups during that time. And we also had interviews with our academic chairs and deans to get the administrative viewpoint. So the nine-month process ended in May of this year. So as of May, we do have an official institutional policy and procedure for the use of OER. Um, and as part of that, we also developed a basic evaluation rubric for materials. Um, we also put together a package with the committee developing a communication plan for the campus and an education process. Um, we now have a supporting website and an FAQ document to answer some of those repeating questions that faculty came up with in our various consults. Um, and we're looking to build um, a training plan and um, start really pushing out the, um, the education on this in the fall. So that's where we are in terms of this development. Um, in terms of the process, some of the interesting things were similar to what Rebecca mentioned, that it was, it was sometimes difficult. They raised a lot of concerns from faculty, a lot of, is this being mandated? And so our very first thing on our FAQ is, do I have to do OER? And it says, no, it's an option. The good news is, for us is that it shifted our culture from an, a culture of no as the default to yes as the default. So now our uh, academic chairs and our deans know that, that this is something that we should be doing, that it is encouraged by the administration, that it's supported um, from them, and that they should talk to those early adopters and those interested faculty about how to do it as opposed to telling them, no, it's not a good fit. Um, some of the highlights, I guess, from the policy are that it is more prescriptive, so, uh, or sorry, not prescriptive. It doesn't give you step-by-step. -step. It, it more or less outlines who is responsible for decision-making and lets the uh, different areas have some flexibility in deciding the actual process. But it does also explain how um, training is going to occur, who's going to support various types of activities like the technology aspect of it, the uh, licensing aspect of it, the repository aspect of it, um, and hopefully also stress the, um, the need for accessibility and the need for diversity and um, good quality evaluation practices. At least that's what we hope in, will be read into the wording. So I guess that's kind of a, the highlight. Um, there's some other things I can talk about in terms of like the planning process and some of the um, research that we did with other Canadian institutions that was kind of interesting. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that later. Super, thank you, Jessica. That was um, a great overview and congratulations on the recent completion of that policy. So um, I would now like to turn things over to Billy. Okay, I'm unmuted, awesome. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Billy Meinke. Um, I am the OER technologist for the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus. Um, I work for the Outreach College, which is one college within the campus. 
um, but we have a, a 10 campus system across, uh, across the state um, doing lots of really good OER work. Um, I'm gonna post a link into the chat that sort of gives some context, some very detailed context as to what happened with OER policy in our state. Um, we've been working on OER for a few years now. I've been in my current position for almost two years, but we have really dedicated uh, librarians throughout the system that are working on OER and making some progress. Um, at our campus, we run a $50,000 per year um, OER grant program to incentivize the adoption and creation of new OER, and that's going very well. Um, we just released a few original titles, a couple remix version, versions of books um, for our courses uh, about a month ago. Um, we have more on the way. Um, but back to policy, um, so earlier this year, um, when all these, these new bills, uh, proposed bills came out, there was one about OER, and we were totally blown away, totally caught off guard. Um, I, I hate to say it, but we were not involved at all in the process of forming this bill before it happened. Um, and when it came out, it was fairly problematic. Um, one of the major problems was that it mandated the use of OER by all faculty at our university. And that is something that is not only impossible to do, but also grossly violates the academic freedom of our faculty. And so as you can imagine, um, folks are sort of up in arms about it. It's not really cool. We, we try to use, we try to find carrots and not use too much stick when we're trying to support OER. Um, and so basically the first four months of this year, I was down at the legislature, which I had never been to before, uh, a number of times sort of babysitting the bill and seeing how it progressed. Um, Again, I wasn't really in contact with the senators of the Higher Education Committee that sort of moved it through, but lots of folks were chiming in. Um, essentially, uh, the bill went through four iterations and the mandates, after all the kickback, the mandates to use OER um, were removed. Um, later on, uh, an OER grant program that sort of mirrored what we're doing at our campus was included in the bill and it seemed like it was, was probably going to be passed. Um, and then at the last minute, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it happened, um, but some pretty major mis mistakes were made and some actual uh, inaccuracies with regard to copyright law were introduced to the bill. Um, the, the word or the, the wording open educational resources was, re was removed from the bill um, and somehow uh, a task force that was part of the bill um, that was tasked with uh, assessing OER adoption for high enrollment courses throughout the entire system, um, which was made up of the BCAAs from, from all our campuses uh, had an, a, a textbook industry publisher added to the task force with no rationale, no reasoning, no, no real explanation. Um, and then sort of at the end, the bill ended up not being scheduled for a hearing, and so it just sort of died quietly. So you can read the, the blog post um, and sort of find out what happened there. Uh, to, answer, to answer Cable's question, I'm not sure who showed up. Um, but I'm fairly certain that lobbyists from some publisher or AAP or somebody showed up um, and whispered in the ears of someone who's, whose opinion matters. Um, and so the bill was, was really tweaked. So maybe in the end, um, having our statewide OER bill um, sort of pass away quietly was the better way to do it so we can have a, a better chance as a, as a, at a good OER bill later on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. I will say that um, locally at our campuses, we were making progress in terms of um, campus specific policy. I know Leeward Community College um, had, uh, had something going through faculty senate that had not yet been approved, but they were working on it to um, reward or somehow incentivize faculty that are working with OER. Um, like I said, we have our grant program at our campus. It was things were moving along anyway. So the idea of whether or not a statewide bill was needed for this to work you know, we don't actually know if we need a statewide bill for it to work, especially when you consider the funding amount. Um, it was only $50,000 for the statewide uh, grant program. Um, and when you compare that to other states such as New York and Georgia that have had, you know, multi-million dollar investments, that's probably more along the lines of, of what might help. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the gist of it. I'll sort of, I'll end there and uh, I'll hand it back over to Karen. Thanks, Billy, and thanks to all of our guests for sharing their range of stories. Um, it's really great to 
hear about what's going on out there. So this is the point where we turn it over to all of you. There are 55 people in this call, and I'm sure that many of you have questions, comments, your own um, experiences you'd like to share. So um, it's really your voices that we want to hear. So I'm going to pause and give people a chance to either write in the chat or turn on their microphone and um, get the conversation going with our guests. Still holding the pause. <laughs> All right. If that's how it's going to be, I will uh, go back to um, Rebecca and um, ask you to explore something that you mentioned in your um, five minute. Oh, we've gotten the chat. Thank you. Matthew DiCarlo is asking In Virginia, we have a mandate to implement a plan for OER low cost textbooks. What messaging has been effective to get administration buy-in? And also Cable's raising his hand. Super, so we'll start with you, Matthew, and then um, go to Cable. Anyone have thoughts on uh, Matthew's question? And it doesn't just have to be our guests, it could be others out there who have experience. From my experience, the best way to get administrative buy-in is to get the students to talk to the administrators. They, uh, that's what really sparked it here is student, the student government taking some concerns to the president about the cost of course materials in general. Cool. Um, how, I guess, how do you sort of walk the line of not trying to rabble rouse too much um, and while still trying to get student buy-in? Um, I guess, I don't know how to walk that line a bit. Um, I'll jump in. Um, so it's it's sort of a, a very delicate thing you have to do. Um, I've met with our student senate on my campus um, a number of times, sort of at the beginning of the year, I give them the, the OER pitch, the OER, like, look at this awesome thing that we can do, um, and I ask them questions about, you know, how they deal with textbooks, and quite often the answer, or they have a question for me, and it is, it is um, you know, if they Google the name of their textbook and download the first PDF they find, is that okay? Um, and that's when it's like, whoa, let's step back and have a bigger conversation about this. Um, our student senate actually drafted a, a senate resolution in support of OER a couple years ago. And um, as all uh, resolutions like that go, copies of it were sent to um, the university president, chancellor, uh, faculty senate, and all that, so they know about it. Um, I would say in terms of um, getting buy-in from administrators, um, like any campus, our campus is, is driven by enrollment numbers and sort of um, return on investment. And so if we can show, we have to you know, demonstrate that the numbers make sense in terms of how much we can save students, especially when you consider that we have some courses that many, many students take, not just at my campus, but throughout the system. And so if we can um, sort of replace a traditional textbook with an OER textbook, we're talking about somewhere along the lines of you know, a quarter million dollars a year just for one big bio course. Um, and so demonstrating those numbers to the administrators, you know, when you're trying to look at policy, that, that really helps. It's really important. They don't, you know, the uh, sort of the innovation piece and sort of all the neat things you can do with OER once it's open, that does appeal to them in some way, but it's less concrete. So um, we just have to kind of turn to the numbers. Thank you. I think what happened with um, uh, the University of Hawaii system, all the 10 campuses, is that uh, uh, a few of the uh, student congresses um, spoke with some of our House representatives, and that's how it kind of kicked off. So that, so that was problematic. That was a good example of things kind of getting out of hand. The other thing I had heard that to, uh, was that two of the House representatives had attended an educational conference um, in uh, continental U.S. and um, were introduced to the concept of OER. So they were really excited and came back, met with students. We had representatives that visited all the 10 campuses, um, talked to student uh, representatives, got the idea that this had to be done, and then it just kind of got out of hand. The Washington State 
uh, also has throughout the state, the student governments are lobbying the legislature pretty heavily to support and to pass some OER bills. And so from the administrative perspective, as Billy said, they would rather that came internally that we're already addressing this and we don't need the legislator to create some sort of law that's going to be difficult to uh, comply with. Yeah, I'll also say that um, our university system is part of the state. Um, and so there is some tension between the state and the university um, in terms of the state dictating um, how we do things. And so that's something to be mindful depending on what your, your campus or your institution is like. Um, sort of acknowledging that, um, you know, OER is not the only thing that everybody's working on. And so uh, making sure that everybody's on the same page um, and, and trying to get, get to a similar place or have the same direction is really important. We had to do a, a certain amount of damage control because some of our faculty senates reacted pretty badly to uh, this, uh, to the mandate. Sure. Okay, we've got a lot of great conversation also happening in the chat along with resources. Thank you everyone for sharing your experience um, working with students and then also showing cost savings. Um, I think I will uh, turn things to Cable who has his hand raised in the chat. Cable? Yeah, just a short comment. Um, one of the strategies which has been quite successful in states in the United States, in provinces in Canada in particular, have been to, as a first step, to have public information sessions or hearings with, with the state legislature. And to do, usually that's done um, off cycle. So it's not when they're busy and making bills and have all their meetings, but it's done oftentimes in the summer when it's a little bit less stressful um, it's not that they're passing anything or you're asking them to, it's just an, it's an awareness raising session or an information session. And, and usually they'll give you more time. So oftentimes you'll get a half hour or 45 minutes. And then, uh, and then if you're lucky, you can get meetings with the chairs after the fact. And to do those both with the higher ed committees and with the K-12 or the primary and secondary education committees. Um, and that way, they tend, if you do that, they tend not to spiral into these, some of these crazy ideas like we've seen in, in particular states. And so as a first step to bring them up to speed, it also develops a relationship between the OER advocates and people who are really knowledgeable about open education and the legislature. So when they have questions, they know who to go to. Um, and then when you want something or you want a grant program or you want money, you've already brought them up to speed. So this is some, when I used to work in the community colleges in Washington state, um, this is something that we did quite regularly. We'd go back annually and not only brief them about the new research and the new metrics that were coming out of our OER projects, um, but would, if we wanted any legislation at that point, we'd already talked about it internally as a community college system, we'd worked with our student leadership to make sure we were in line with them. And then we were all on the same page as the academy before we ever took it to the legislature. Um, and that's, it takes a lot of work, but if you can kind of manage the relationship that way and that sequence, it helps. Um, Sunny, it looks like I'm just going through the chat here. So uh, you guys, please uh, raise your hand or, or turn on your mic if you want to stick to a particular topic. I'm just trying to cover everything and there's lots of great discussion happening here. Um, Sunny, you have a question, uh, how the different policies uh, handle copyright for faculty? Um, that's a question for our guests. Can you guys speak to that, please? How do the different policies handle copyright for faculty? Oh, I'll, I'll jump in real quick and just say that the original version of the statewide OER bill that we saw, um, it not only mandated the use of OER in all courses, but it also said that if OER weren't available for certain courses, uh, the faculty were required to create and release it as OER. So in that sense, they were going to be, um, uh, the, the copyright decision was made for them. So something, something to keep in mind. As we were working our policy through, that was one of the um, 
the Attorney General really wanted WSU to hold the copyright and and make it open, but not to use the Creative Commons licenses, and that was something we had to argue against. So our policy states that if the university is funding development of OER, that it will be licensed as CC BY through Creative Commons. So for our policy at state, we're coming from a slightly different model or background in that um, historically our institution has a policy that says any materials created by employees are owned by the institution, which means that if a faculty member develops materials for their course in the course of their daily work, the institution owns that curriculum material and the institution holds the copyright. So in our case, in the past, OER wasn't a possibility because the folks in, in our curriculum development group simply stated no, they weren't going to allow it to be open. It was going to be a classic copyright um, applied. Um, our policy was basically our institution saying that while they still may um, st still retain the um, the ownership of copyright that control, they're now going to grant the faculty the ability to make the decision to, to apply a CCBY or other Creative Commons license. If there's some reason that they can't use CCBY, we'll discuss it with them and, and help figure out the appropriate um, version. Um, but that that's now allowed by the institutional um, policy. So we basically went from a culture of saying no to a culture of saying yes. Uh, as an institution and giving the faculty more freedom in making those decisions as they see fit. Um, for WSU and Alberta, um, how much are you funding your faculty? Are, are we talking $50,000, $20,000? Well, in Alberta and state specifically, we don't currently have a funding model um, outside of typical curriculum work. So in other words, if it's already in their job description to develop a new course, or if it's something they've been assigned to do, then the OER work is seen to be simply part of the typical curriculum development process. Um, there is discussion. I'm in discussion with our administration to do some micro grants. Uh, and I'm guessing the budget would be like a $50,000 kind of a budget if I can get that approved but that hasn't actually gone through yet. I do know though other institutions, University of Calgary, University of Alberta, the larger research universities do have funding available. Those are all from in-house um, programs. So our provincial government, our federal government, as far as I'm aware, isn't offering any kind of uh, grant opportunities at this time. We've had two different rounds of grants. One was the seed grants through the provost office and both the provost and the president committed a certain amount of money, uh, which we granted this last year. And we already had a precedent at WSU. We have one of our colleges that pays faculty $4,500 to create and develop a new online course and $1,500 to um, revise an online course so we kind of work from there we're paying 4500 if faculty are developing new oer we're paying between 1500 and 2500 if what they're doing is adopting revising so they have to submit a proposal that indicates how much work it's going to be and then it's those three levels basically um, i wanted to reach back to copyright for just a moment um, and emphasize how important it is to get that right from the beginning. Um, so like I said, our, the bill for our statewide OER, you know, the statewide OER bill, um, it originally had really good language in it, strong language that specified, you know, what OER are, public domain or CC license or equivalent. Um, but then at the end, the final version of the bill that removed OER from the bill itself, um, it actually stated in the committee report that OER removed from the bill because OER are proprietary which is on its face, just it's completely wrong. Um, I used to work for Creative Commons, Cable Green used to be my, my supervisor. Um, and so again, like 
if, if you guys think that legislation, big legislation is going to be coming across or any kind of policy has to do with OER, make sure strong, correct language about what OER are legally um, is included and make sure that it doesn't sway at all. Um, and so you, you can read the blog post I linked earlier, um, but basically um, my thought is if they're able to disqualify OER from the bill because they're proprietary, which is not correct, um, then when you look at uh, proprietary publisher content, which is proprietary, um, that, may be, it, that may be something that should be disqualified from consideration um, because it really is not going to have the long lasting major impactful effects that OER will because OER are, are open forever once they're open. Thanks, Billy. And Cable um, said in the chat that Creative Commons is always happy to help review and or help write open policy language and meet with lawyers as needed. So they're a wonderful resource you can turn to. Um, definitely don't have to go at it alone. Um, there is some talk in the chat um, going back to students and student advocacy. Michelle, I would like to invite you to share um, your story that you mentioned in the chat and tell us a little bit more about the success uh, you had with students there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so last year, it took a couple of tries, but um, well, shortly after I started, I've been in my position for a little less than two years. I started contacting student government, trying to get people interested and involved. It took several times, but I eventually got through to the student body president who worked very closely with me over the last year. Um, we had lots of conversations about what OER is all about. And uh, she, she was just incredible and got a number of people on board. Um, we had probably three or four student volunteers who assisted with Open Education Week last year. So they led outreach on that. Um, they did some data collection. So they parked uh, outside of the bookstore at the beginning of the semester and collected some local information about how much students are paying for resources. She's also presented to the Provost Dean Council. She's done a TED talk on OER um, and is, she just graduated. I said, unfortunately in the chat and then I felt really bad about that. Like, it's wonderful. We want them to graduate, but I miss her already. Um, but the wonderful thing about that is she got another student from student government involved. She was a freshman last year. She was voted in as vice president this year and is really eager to continue her work on OER. So we still have that connection. Um, and I'm hoping that's how we'll see all of this play out um, as we move forward with people as they kind of roll off getting new students involved. But um, there was a little bit of a, she was also involved in um, the access code situation. So that's not something that I had any input in, but students separately were complaining to the president. He has some informal meet and greet events with students and they took advantage of the opportunity to um, share their thoughts about access codes. And that led to an investigation. Uh, our student body president got involved at that point and just didn't let it drop, especially knowing that there's an open solution. It really fueled her interest in this. And so now we have what is called a moratorium or, or what the provost has called a moratorium on access codes, which means that all of the courses that are currently using uh, an access code have to investigate other options and courses that do not currently use access codes will not be allowed to begin using access codes. So that is um, recent developments over the last couple of months. It is going to significantly impact what our work looks like over the next year, but um, we're still sorting that out. All of this is happening while faculty are, are away over the summer. So <laughs> they're gonna come back next month and things are gonna look a little different. So um, stay tuned for that. I'm not sure what's gonna happen next, to be honest. Well, please keep us updated, Michelle, and thanks for sharing your story. Talking about how this outstanding student, it sounds like sort of passed the baton as she graduated, leads uh, me to Kristen Woodward's question. Um, are any of your student advocates interested in talking with students who are just becoming aware of OER advocacy? And of course, there are, there's the PERGs, 
Um, but Kristen, when you when you made that comment, I actually pictured some awesome student, you know, national network. Um, but tell us um, what it is you're looking for, what you think would be helpful. Maybe there are others out there who um, feel the same or, or could offer a buddy. Did you unmute me, Karen? You are unmuted, yes. Okay, very good. I hope I wasn't typing too loudly. Um, <laughs> so um, my um, recent experience is that our um, student government um, became interested in uh, affordability broadly, and they seem to be very focused on a traditional reserve library, even though their survey results pointed um, directly to um, the inconvenience of a traditional reserve library for our very diverse um, and distributed and online focused campus. Um, and one of the things that's difficult is that um, when they hear from me things that I think would work, and I'm glad to hear others saying that, um, you know, there's perhaps an order in which to um, do some education before we lobby for policy, either on campus or in the state. Those are the kinds of experiences and um, sort of um, shortcuts I would like them to know more about. Um, when it comes from me, it sounds like I'm telling them that I don't want them to do this work, when in fact I just want them to um, do it with some um, wisdom behind it that makes good use of their time. So I feel like that might um, be better coming from peers that have had some success with it. I don't know how others feel about that or about the feasibility of that. Um, I know the students are very busy just kind of holding down um, the good work that they're doing on their own campuses. So I think just like in life, um, the good students are often the ones asked to do a lot of different things. Um, and so this might be adding to their work, but if there were a way to maybe develop a forum for them of some kind, that might be, a, or to see if they're interested in doing that. I'm interested in your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. I'm interested too. Thoughts on Kristen's comment? Kristen, I think the thoughts are going to evolve over time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Jessica. I wish I could offer more information on that, but unfortunately, we're, being from a two-year organization, our students rotate very quickly through their student government positions. And I'm just starting again this summer to have a conversation with our incoming officers. And while I have a couple that are very keen on the concept of OER, I'm kind of in the same boat in terms of trying to figure out good onboarding procedures and good ways to kind of help them shortcut the process of, of learning about this and then being able to effectively uh, work with administration or lobby on students' behalf and those kind of things. So I, I don't know answers. I wish I did. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, this is Kathy Labrador at the University of Connecticut. And we have a very, very active uh, PERG group as well as USG here at UConn. And Ethan Senek is one of our uh, alums and Simon Azimi, who's, who's doing PERG nationally now, is one of our people that was on our group when I started uh, working at this. And um, what, what we did with the, what I was wondering last year, or actually it was two years ago, uh, I know we're focusing on getting faculty to know what OER are, how faculty do need to know. But my question was, uh, do students know what OER is and, um, and the issues surrounding OER? And so our, our PER group um, did, uh, they tabled. They tabled uh, across the campus uh, in dining halls, in the student union, and they, they had a survey and over 900 students replied I mean, actually did their survey, and they found out how much uh, money they spent on their 
their textbooks last year, you know, what they know about it. They had a lot of questions and I have their report. I don't, I only have it as a Word doc and not as a, uh, a link. But I could put it up in my Google Drive and then link to the Google Drive, I suppose, if you'd like to see their final report, which they made last March. They created it last March. So, uh, so this way, not only were they bringing the OER issue and making students know, uh, and they were asking what faculty, what other faculty do you have that um, try to make the course the least uh, expensive um, as possible. And we found, I, I learned a lot more new names of faculty who are really on OER side and who are doing everything they can that weren't using OER, but they were, um, they were actually the issue of saving the students money. So you can find out a lot of uh, information. And uh, again, uh, here at UConn, it really was a, a ground, from the ground up kind of, uh, it started with the students. So it started with the students who knew, the USG students and the PERV students. So it's, I think it's really great to get students out there who are really um, supportive of the like the per group of OER and know a lot about it talk with their students so um, is that does anyone want to see the final report from UConn? Yeah, Kathy yeah. that would be great. There, there okay. In the chat. All right. like, All right. I'll figure out how to do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Kathy. And um, also in the chat, it looks like uh, Kristen is being connected with uh, other people who um, have some potential resources, whether it be students or guides or toolkits. Um, Christina, you've been really active in the chat. Do you want to talk a bit about um, student advocacy that your uh, student governors worked on? Sure, that, this was uh, in British Columbia. I'm at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, and we had, we've had varying levels of, of activist students uh, over the years on OER. The toolkit that I put into the chat was created by some from about three years ago, I think. Um, and then we, we went for a year with, with not as, as active students. And then last year we had pretty active students. And now we're waiting to see what the new <laughs> elections have brought us. Um, but one of the things we found a few years ago was that students could get meetings with administrators that I, as a faculty member, I couldn't just, you know, email the president and say, hey, let's have a meeting, but the student government could. Uh, or, you know, provost office or other kinds of senior administrators. So that was really useful. Um, they, they seem to have a platform and a voice that's, that's a bit stronger in that regard than um, faculty advocates or, or staff advocates or librarian advocates. So that's been really great. Um, one of the things they did was, and Jenny Heyman was asking me about this in the chat, they talk to our a committee who advises the president on promotion and tenure and manage to get into a guide that committee creates for promotion and tenure um, some information about creation of oer now this applies mostly to we have two faculty streams one is research and one is teaching and the teaching faculty stream has to do educational leadership to get promoted and to get tenure and creating OER can count as educational leadership because it's basically producing something that has impact beyond your own class. Um, so that now is, it's not an official policy, it's sort of a guideline of what can count. It's not like a policy policy it hasn't been you know, passed anywhere. Um, but that was a significant step for us in, in helping at least that track of faculty see that there's some value in it. And they've also done a lot of work on, um, uh, somebody was describing standing outside the bookstore or getting data on how much students are spending, doing a whole social media campaign called Textbook Broke BC uh, to try to raise awareness around other students. So, I mean, that's just a couple of things that, that they have done. Thanks, Christina. Um, Jonathan, you've also been um, offering some experiences. You mentioned a survey in Colorado. 
um, and you had a couple questions for Billy. Are you willing to um, unmute? Sure. Um, I hi. I yes. No. I uh, we had a we did a as part of a, a, a bill um, a year ago to to get information from you know we are we some some people give examples of, of legislatures sort of stumbling along the way but we were lucky in Colorado we had a bill that brought a, a group together to find information and make a careful considered proposal which was pretty directly turned into the bill that was passed earlier this year and so we're going to get started implementing that in the next few weeks actually but as part of the bill that set us up that we were supposed to survey current use so we did a great big survey and we had i don't remember the number but it was thousands of respondents from across the state and we had parents and librarians and k-12 through and faculty and like um, administrators and it people on campuses and the, the takeaway message from that was absolutely your librarians know what's going on and talk to them um, and the faculty administrators, you know, don't. So educate them, <laughs> um, and certainly students and um, parents um, don't. It was interesting, one thing I did, uh, I actually got the data and I sort of disaggregated it a little bit, and I found, one of the, another question we asked is, how important is um, a textbook cost to you? Um, and so parents and students answered that and said quite important. And uh, faculty and administrators all had a, okay, you know, we see it could be important, but um, not so important. And I sort of disaggregated by um, tenured faculty and other groups. That was the only, only resolution we had was tenured faculty and non-tenured. So probably, presumably, um, you know, people who are adjuncts or lecturers or also a tenure track who hadn't yet got tenure. So I was viewing that as some sort of proxy for how old you are or how long you've been in the business. And I found that the older faculty response on the question, how important is textbook cost to you was significantly lower than the other faculty group. So clearly there's a sort of age component to this. And, you know, it's because we gray haired folk, when we were younger, textbooks were not proportionally as expensive as they are today. So I think there's an interesting lesson there to be learned about. I don't know how to make an action item out of that, but um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's uh, anyway, our report, if you want our report, it's if you search on the Colorado, Colorado OER um, Council, it's on the Colorado website, or if you just if you Google my name, it's on my page uh, um, where I have all my shared resources. But. Thanks, Jonathan. And was there something you wanted to ask Billy? I seem to recall seeing a yes. question. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, Billy, you, you were talking about how the you, you feel like maybe you were blindsided by lobbyists speaking for commercial publisher interests. I was wondering, does, does Hawaii have a, an, an in-state public commercial publishing interest? Because that, you know, often if there's a big corporation in a state, they can influence the legislators. Or the alternative would be if there was no possible source, then maybe the, let the commercial publishers are sort of going across state lines because they're afraid that if this movement starts, even in states where they're not registered, that this may take off and, and hit their bottom line in the long run. Sure, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that there is um, you know, a publishing organization here in Hawaii that would have been you know, uh, listening in on this, but I know it caught the attention of national groups that, are, that their interest is in maintaining publishing revenues and that sort of thing. Um, and so, um, you know, if you if you read the, the Spark that puts out the OER Digest, um, they talk about the bills that come through that kind of thing. Our bill was mentioned in that several times, and then as it died quietly, we stopped hearing about it. Um, so lots of people knew about it. Um, the National Association of College Stores (NACS) they knew about it early on. That's actually who I found out about our bill from. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what happened. I do know um, there was a, a conference that happened the week after um, one of the, the hearings in the bill. Um, I know that Pearson and Cengage were both on island and they don't normally, they have one representative um, for the state, each of them do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not totally sure, but um, yeah, we, we were kind of blindsided. As Sunny mentioned earlier, we, we are pretty sure, but not actually sure um, that our statewide, um, you know, group of student senators from all the campuses got together and talked to the senator that introduced the bill. 
Um, but that wasn't actually spoken. Like no one ever said that that had happened. We're pretty sure it did, but we're not totally sure. Um, but yeah, again, we, um, so in, in the original language of the bill, um, they actually had copied and pasted text from oer.hawaii.edu, our OER website into the bill. So they know they're aware of us. Um, in, in the committee, in the, in the hearings, they talked about the UH OER team um, as something more of a, a formalized group. We are more of an informal group um, that are, it's, we're a network from throughout the state. Um, but there were, um, yeah, there was a little confusion about what we're doing um, and, and what was going to be effective. And so um, if they just come and talk to us and maybe um, if, if, I'm not sure if publishers were involved at the end there, but if they were, it would have been great to at least know about it. Um, but that, as legislation goes, you know, even, even as a bill um, goes through all the hearings, crosses the house, um, cross the, between the houses and, and is passed, there's even a final moment where in the closed door committee, the bill can change before it's sent to the, uh, to be signed up into law. So, you know, we, we tried our best to pay attention to it, but the, to get back to your original question, I don't actually know that there's a group um, in Hawaii that would have been sort of lobbying on behalf of the publishers. Actually in Colorado, when we had our meetings um, a year ago to prepare our proposal, um, one day because of, and they're, they're open by Colorado state law, these are open public meetings. And one day there was a person sitting in the back and, I, and we found out this was an Elsevier representative. So and certainly Elsevier is not, um, does not have a corporate headquarters in Colorado. So clearly they're aware of these things and they come, but they then stopped coming and I went to all of the hearings at the budget committee in the legislature and it was very, it sort of, it sailed through with very little attention. I saw you got, you got, unfortunately you got too much attention and so that's why they, they went after you, I guess. Since yeah. uh, the conference that, I'm um, sorry, that I have to go soon, I'm sorry, uh, that Billy was referring to is a conference held by all the community colleges um, across the state. And um, uh, Cengage had a huge presence there. They, they bought all the swag basically. And they also ran a workshop um, about their, um, you know, their access products. So, but it's only community colleges at that point. They've been tracking our um, statewide community college conferences. We've been presenting um, about OER for the last four years, and we constantly have been noticing Pearson and Cengage representatives coming to the conference. So they're, they're watching us very closely. Um, so we've, we've just been kind of managing that relationship. Thank you all. Um, we're, we're rounding close to the hour here, um, and I think we have time for another question. I just wanted to um, call everyone's attention to Jenny's helpful note, which pretty much read my mind, which was how we're going to save all these links in the chat. So you can do so personally, and we also are going to do so um, collectively for the group. But uh, you can click on the save chat feature in Zoom in that little gray more button so that you're not like manically copying and pasting links from the chat so that um, you don't forget them. So that's a good feature. Liz, I saw you had a question about bookstores. Um, has that been answered? Do you want to pose that to the guests if not? Um, Karen, I think, I think Ed and Michelle provided some really great resources. Is, okay. um, my question was around the limitations in some of the student systems and actually seeing that an OER was used for a course, but um, in the chat there's some great links from Michelle and Ed. Thank you. Super, thanks. Um, any other questions you guys want to squeeze in before we say farewell? There may be things that I missed in the chat. It's been a, it's been a wide ranging, uh, very rich conversation and may indicate we should revisit. Um, final thoughts from our guests as we wrap up. Of course, many thanks to the three of you. Um, any closing thoughts based on our time together today? I had just a quick note on policy in Texas last year, and this is why we have all of the work around uh, OER course markings, but last year the state passed a bill and it required course markings, it established a grant program and called for a feasibility study for a repository. The uh, call for proposals just came out on the grant program and they are requiring either that in resources developed are placed into the public domain 
or licensed CC by SANC, which is so bizarre to me. There is an option in there for people to request a different license in the project narrative when they apply, but it's not the default. So um, I was really initially very thankful that I wasn't tasked to be on this working group, but now I'm like, oh, but they needed some help because I, I don't know how this licensing requirement came to be. So that's just a note that some strange things are happening in Texas. And if you have a chance to involve yourself in what those grant programs look like early on, maybe you should try to do that. Thanks, Michelle. And also, I see uh, Matthew's question. Anyone worked with their disciplines accrediting body on OER? Have any of our three guests or anyone else in the call? I see head shaking no. Not at stake, no. Okay. No, I haven't. I'd say that um, in terms of tenure and promotion, um, it's up to the individual departments within the colleges within our university to do that. And so we have a couple different departments that have, you know, in, in their guidelines, which are not policy, um, stated, you know, general support for OER. And they may look at a candidate who's going up for, for tenure promotion more positively if they've been doing those kinds of activities with OER. Um, but uh, it's, it's really sort of, it's all over the place. Um, and, and not every department has, has adopted any kind of language like that. Okay, thanks, Billy. And thank you, Rebecca Vandevoord at Washington State University. Thank you, Jessica Norman at Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. And thank you, Billy Meinke at University of Hawaii. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, another great conversation and we look forward to more in the coming months. Until then, I hope you have a great rest of the week.